Hi, I was discuss programming in that lab. Uh, we've already uh, talked about functions. Uh, functions, that's a key element of, of writing programs. Uh, that was done in its own M file. Uh, each function went into its own special M file. Uh, now we'll be talking about maybe a, a more basic idea, but quite fundamental to, to writing programs, and that is loops and decision-making if statements. These go into your M file. They don't need to be in a special kind of M file. They just go in a regular M file. Uh, these two commands, the, or these two concepts, loops and branches, would make really any sense if you did it as a command window, however. So this, this shows that an M file is actually a little bit more than just a list of commands because the concept of looping through a set of commands, it just I, I can't see how you could ever type that in as a command window. It, it has to be a set of commands uh, defining the loop, and then inside the loop is the commands that are repeated. Uh, that would have to be in an M file to, to work at all. But, but we can do that in M file, so we'll be doing that now. Uh, now, first, we're going to need uh, logical expressions. Um, the need for logical expressions is pretty clear. It's uh, the um, if, if statements have a start with a true or false condition, while loops have a true or false condition at the top. So we have to have these logical expressions to decide true or false. That's not the only time you might use them, but it's, uh, it's a key thing for, for those ideas. So uh, just like in C++, double equal sign is a check, are they equal? The tilde is the not symbol. So if you want to say not equal, it's tilde equal, as opposed to in C++, there's an exclamation point. So there's a little difference there. Uh, same thing as before for and and or. Now, if you do a command like a less than b, uh, that actually returns a Boolean or logical uh, array. Assuming that a and b are the exact same size and shape, then at the corresponding spots, what it's going to do is compare item by item to see which ones are less than. And wherever it's less than, wherever a is less than b, it's going to put a 1 in that spot. Wherever a is greater than b, it's going to put a 0. Uh, so indicating true or false. You can use the keywords true and false, by the way. Those are defined in MATLAB, but you could use 1 and 0 also. Uh, so if statements are pretty straightforward, uh, not quite as um, clear, perhaps, in some ways, as what you can do with, with C++. But the issue, it gets, it's, it's a little harder, actually, if you have nested if statements. But if you just have a single if statement, it's really straightforward. There's no syntax at all. There's just the word if and then a logical expression. And by, by no syntax, I mean there's no curly brackets, there's no semicolon, just a list of commands, and then another list of commands, separated by the word else. So uh, you have an if, and then a logical expression, true or false. Follow that if statement on the next line, you're going to have the first command, and you could have a whole set of commands there uh, for the true case. Then when it hits the word else, the editor will automatically show a little signal that that else belongs with that other if. So it's, it's kind of a nice little highlighting to tell you which one belongs with which. Um, but uh, then after the else, you have another set of commands that will only happen in the false case for that if statement. And then you have to end with an end. An end gets overused a little bit, so you might actually want to follow that end with a comment. If you had a lot of loops and if statements all in one end file, you probably would want to put a comment after all your end statements to tell you which one belongs with which. It also tries to show you that in the, in the uh, graphically, but um, it, it might be good just to also document it in the text. For loops, the syntax is the word for, and then an index variable. Uh, MATLAB is not real picky about integers being there like, like it should be, but um, you probably ought to think of your index and your start and your stop and your step values all as integers. Though I think it'll it'll accept loops there just fine. MATLAB is going to suffer potentially from the same Randolph error issues that, that C++ has, though. So uh, it's it's best to think of those as integers or treat them as integers. Uh, anyway, you got an index variable must be a variable, and then the other three could be a variable or a constant, a start value, a step value. So that's a little different than the way we did it in C and C++. The middle number is your step size, and then your stop value. Is the, is the final value um, or the extreme value. You might actually skip over that value, but you, you won't go beyond it. You won't print a value that's beyond it. You just may use a value that's beyond it. And then again, the word end to, to denote that these are the end of the commands that are being repeated, but no curly brackets. Uh, we also have while loops. If you
you don't know how many times it's going to loop, or if you can't define how many times it's going to loop with a variable or variables, then you need something like this, simply a logical expression that gets checked uh, every time through the loop and tells the time to end. Uh, that's the only flavor of while loop I know of. Uh, do while and while loops can always, you can always program with either. You never really need both. C++ includes both while and do while as a convenience for, for different styles, uh, but the while loop by itself should be enough. It would be nice to have the do while also, but um, but it's actually not necessary. You can always write it with either. All right, let's go through the examples on this uh, lecture. I have to get out of the show here. Uh, we're going through lecture four from the website, and um, specifically I want to play around with these logical expressions just a little bit so we can get used to those. Let's say we have a variable x is equal to 6, and y, capital Y, is equal to 3, and I say x greater than y, it says answer is 1. If, on the other hand, I said x less than y, says the answer is zero. So there's a logical expression. If x instead was an array, 5, 6, negative 2, and y was another array, column, I'm sorry, row, 3, 10, 5, and I do the same thing, x greater than y, 1, 0, 0, x less than y, 0, 1, 1. So it shows that the uh, result of doing this on arrays is uh, an array of the same size and shape as the original two with zeros and ones in there representing true or, or false. Mostly you just go with one some thing, especially if you're getting ready for a while loop or an if statement. It, it's not like you're going to do this with a vector. You're going to be doing it with scalars, comparing one number to another number or one string to another string uh, and, and just loop and tell that's happening that's done or branch based on, on that, um, but um, you, know, you, you have these options. Uh, and then you could combine these. Let's go back to how we had it before. X is 5 and Y is 8 this time and Z is 2. If I want to know if X is the biggest, I can say X greater than, I'll put it in, in parentheses for clarification, X greater than Y and x greater than z, I get false. I believe y was the biggest one, so let me just change x. So I'll now say x is 20, so it's the biggest. Do it again, now I get an answer of 1. So that shows that uh, it's, that's a way to check to see that x is the biggest of the three numbers. Uh, just like in c, you can't say x greater than y and z. You have to say x greater than y and x greater than z uh, for that to make any sense. So we've got those compound logical expressions if you need those. Um, now let's uh, put that into uh, an if statement. Uh, we're going to, I'll, I'll use an m file because if statements really don't make any sense if they're not in an m file. So file, new m file, and I'm pasting this from the website. There it is. I call the file, I'm going to call the file find v, find underscore v. Uh, this is a problem finding the velocity from the energy equation for a spring mass system. Uh, if you have uh, kinetic energy and potential energy and a total energy, total energy is E, then the total energy is equal to kinetic energy plus potential energy. If you're going to solve for velocity given x, then well, here's the original equation. If, I, if I'm solving for velocity and I know x and I know e, then that usually works fine except that if x is too big, it's outside the, the range where the mass would be oscillating, then you'd get an imaginary velocity because energy minus this number is going to be a negative number. And when I do the square root, I'm going to get the square root of a negative number. So this if statement is protecting us from that. Uh, I ask the user to enter a value for x, and then instead of going ahead and calculating velocity right off, I calculate the quantity that I would be doing the square root of. And I check to see 
if it's a positive number or not. I've solved for uh, velocity squared rather than solving for velocity. If temp is greater than zero, then I go ahead and calculate the square root of temp and set that equal to V. Because I didn't put a semicolon here, that will immediately appear on the screen. It's a lot different than C++ where you would need to follow a C out command. As soon as I do this command, V will appear on the screen simply because that's how MATLAB works. On the other hand, I, I ask them to try again if it uh, is too big of an X value. So let's uh, save this as find underscore V. And it puts in a dot M for me. And in my example, I, I have to set these values, E, M, and K. Those are used in the M file. E is 10 joules. I'll just say 10. M is 2 kilograms. K is 4 newtons per meter. At least that's what I used in here. Yeah, 4 newtons per meter. And now I can run the find V program. Notice that if I, if I hadn't done that, I would have had trouble because my temporary equation, my temp equation, needs to know capital E, M, and K. Um, it also needs to know X, but I'm going to be doing X with user input. Now, this, this M file is not a function. The variables that I defined just now in the main will be accessible through the M file. Um, the main or command window has variables, and those variables are shared with the M file. The M file creates like a variable X, and that'll show up in my workspace. Uh, and let's show that again just to be cl clear. I'm going to clear all. And now when I look at the workspace, there's no variables listed. And then E is 10, M is 2, and K is 4. Now in my workspace, I've got these three variables. Those workspace variables will be visible in the M file. When I say find underscore V, it gives me a little summary. This program finds V given E, M, and K along with user input. Please enter a value for X. I'm going to put a, a really big number like 10. And it says X equals 10. Invalid V. Please try again. If I look at the, vet, if I look at the workspace, I just gained two new variables. Temp, which is negative 190 at this point, and X is 10. Those were not command window variables. Those were variables defined in the, in the M file. The M file really is just an extension of the command window, unless you make it a function. Uh, that's a special use of an M file, but uh, here those variables are visible. All right, so I've got to try again. Uh, I'll try 1, and now it works. V, X is 1, V is 2.828. So once I entered a small enough X value, then it was able to do that square root. Uh, the temporary variable was the positive number uh, here, 8, positive 8, instead of uh, a negative number. So that's a, that's a nice use of the if statement. Now let's uh, try out just a simple loop. Uh, I'll have to put this into an, an M file also. Get rid of the current commands. And just put this loop in here. It's just a for statement. And notice how it's got this uh, neat little minus plus. If I, I can close that up and it puts a dot, dot, dot. It's kind of hard to see maybe, but there's a, there's a way to open it up or close this for statement. That's a really nice little organizational trick. And it also shows you nicely which end goes with which for uh, or with which if. Uh, all this does is go from 1 to 10 in steps of 2. And the only command I've got inside the loop is the display command to print i to the screen. So we're going to watch it count by 2s. And it won't actually, I'm going I'm to save and run, it won't actually um, do number 10, what it prints on the screen is 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. So that shows that I was able to create a loop, run this command five times, uh, and display a different I value every time. You might think you need these a lot because MATLAB is all about matrices and you're going to be doing a lot of matrices. The neat thing about MATLAB is you actually need these for loops a lot less than you would need them for the equivalent C code. C code doesn't have any built-in matrix math. So if you do matrices in C, you either need to download a, a matrix object from somewhere or write a whole bunch of loops uh, with MATLAB because it's all about matrices and it knows how to do the matrices. Naturally, you can just multiply things or use matrix inverse functions or whatever. You've got all these built-in functions that support matrices. 
you actually write loops a lot less than you would uh, normally, but then there are going to be times when you still need a loop uh, where the built-in functions are not sufficient, then you do have the, the four options that create counter-controlled loops. Uh, the final uh, type of loop is a while loop and the other flavor of loop. And this is for when you don't know how many times it's going to loop. For example, uh, the M file loops until the user says that they are done, until the user hits something other than N. Uh, I start off with the X value of 0, a done variable uh, with a string value N, and then a while loop. And actually, it loops as long as they type little n or big n. And each time through, I add one to x and ask the user, are you done yet? This input command has the extra little s at the end so that I'm doing string input rather than numeric input. And then I check if done is little n or big n. It keeps looping. And then I say thank you. So save file and run. Uh, X is 1, done yet. I say no. X is 2, big N, no. As long as I keep typing N, X keeps getting bigger. As soon as I type anything other than little n or big N, it says thank you. Uh, so that shows you can, uh, you can have these loops that accept user input as long as you want until it's done. Or you can read until you run out of data from the file. That would be another thing you might do. A lot of the things we did with while loops are all, they're all visible here. They're all good here in MATLAB, too. I don't feel like the MATLAB command language is, is as good as C++ by any means. It doesn't have a lot of the more advanced features, as far as I know, at least. I, I, haven't, um, I haven't done a lot of MATLAB programming, but from what I've seen, it seems a little simpler than what you can do with C++. It's not as, um, it's not as easy to manipulate. I mean, it's a lot more rigid than what's there. But because you have all these powerful functions, add on to, to MATLAB, you, basically your, your M file just need a little bit of programming. You really don't need a lot of programming for MATLAB. You need a little bit to do exactly what you want with the functions, make, th make things as nice as you need them to be, add user input, or you can create even pop-up windows. And you, can, you can actually do a lot of programming here um, of, of things we haven't really done this semester. But uh, you know, mostly what you're doing is you're calling on uh, MATLAB functions specified ways. That's, that's one of the main things we do with the M file. We're using these powerful functions to do a whole bunch for you. So you really just need a little bit of these things. All right, so that uh, shows just an introduction to the programming in MATLAB and uh, concludes this talk. And next time I'll talk about simulators. Thank you.